Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is sort of a nostalgic return. I can't even remember. The last Ojai event was at Camp Shalom. I can't remember. It must have been three years since we were all together here under the teaching tree. In some ways, a lot of water over the dam. In other ways, uh, five minutes ago. Uh, I just come from two days of speaking in Los Angeles to large audiences which demand a sort of formal intensity that you thankfully relieved me of this morning. Uh, <clears throat> I guess uh, the... Well, how many people have come in here? my books or have been to workshops in the past? Is there anybody who's just utterly unfamiliar? Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. Well, so there's, we'll work from that benchmark out. Um, I never imagined that I would end up sitting in this position and pontificating on the nature of life and history and global human destiny. I, uh, I started out simply with an, uh, a love of nature. I was uh, persecuted as a child in my physical education classes, so I spent a lot of time on my own. And I grew up in western Colorado, where there is a lot of exposed sedimentary rock, and some of it has dinosaurs pressed into it. And I could always feel these dinosaurs. Uh, the largest dinosaur ever found was found a few years ago near Delta, Colorado, about 30 miles from where I grew up. And all the time I was growing up, I knew that sucker was out there. <laughs> and I, but I could never walk to it. Uh, if I could have, probably my career would have taken a different turn. But uh, my interest in fossils, I remember I had an uncle who gave me a book when I was about eight years old of fossils. And it had one of those charts in the front of it, where it shows uh, five billion years, and then the last half inch is expanded to the next column, and then the last half inch is expanded to the next column. And so I saw that human history was a hairline crack at the bottom of the column furthest to the right. And I got the concept of how old, not the universe, but the Earth is. And it was a dizzying perspective. The town I grew up in, if you read Time magazine, you were persecuted as a left-wing intellectual. <laughs> uh, the town I grew up in... Uh, once made it into Ripley's, believe it or not, as a place that had more Christian churches per capita than any town of its size in the United States. This was a town of 1,600 people with 42 Christian churches thriving. Uh, uh, when I was a kid, I thought street corners were four churches. No <laughs> one could have buildings uh, on street corners that weren't churches. And uh, I would go up these dry arroyos with my rock pick looking for fossil shells and uh, and dinosaur bones and uh, and this sort of thing, brachiopods, and in the in the solitude, because I would often not be able to con my little friends into attending me, because they learned quickly that it was hotter out there than decent people could tolerate, and also, I have to confess, 
I, whenever I invited someone to come along, it was with the thought that they would carry back the specimen. So they were essentially pack burrows <laughs> for my fossil expedition. And, uh, and then I had an uncle who was an old rock hound, and he introduced me to the concept of uh, not splitting apart strata to see ancient forms of life, but slicing rocks up and polishing them to reveal the light and the color and sometimes the crystal cavities that were hidden inside them. And so very early on, I got this idea that the surface of things is not where attention should rest that uh, you have to, as uh, Ahab tells Starbuck in Moby Dick, you have to seek the little lower layer. And under the surface of things is uh, another reality, a reality that reaches, in some cases, back to the birth of the planet, practically. Or in other cases, uh, in other dimensions. I had uh, a fixation with meteorites at one time, and butterflies, and rocketry, and all of these things were about uh, a certain thrill, a certain iridescence that could be coaxed out of physical phenomena if you would not just simply dismiss them and pass over them. And as a little kid, I, uh, I had very bad eyes. I still do, but I wear contact lenses. But at that time, I wore very thick bifocal lenses. And my mother, bless her heart, she was cut from somehow different cloth than all the people around me. Uh, read Aldous Huxley's book, The Art of Seeing, which I had an occasion to look at it in the past year, and I was amazed how much of my own attitude toward life is contained in this fairly trivial book. You know, Huxley had terrible eyes, too, and he um, discovered the so-called Batesian method of eye exercises and, and eye help, uh, which at that time, we're talking 1954 or so, was completely sky blue crackpot type stuff. I mean, this was the Eisenhower era. And uh, the exercises that I learned when my mother took me to this, uh, I guess you would say, Batesian uh, therapist, uh, were exercises in attention, in attention to the exterior world. And then the other form of exercise was uh, what the rest of American society wasn't going to encounter for 15 years and then would encounter as Buddhist visualization. But for us, it was just close your eyes and the therapist would create capsules in the air through narrative. And it was an eye exercise. And so I, it introduced me to the idea of sitting still and watching what's going on behind closed eyelids. What fascinated me about the butterflies was the physical iridescence which in the northern hemisphere is fairly rare in butterflies. You only get it in these little blue lysineas that you see fluttering around mud puddles uh, in dry areas. I've seen them here. But of course in the tropics, iridescence uh, becomes a more generalized phenomenon, not only in butterflies, but in beetles as well. And uh, I had the ability to fixate 
on these things, could spend hours with a single pyrite crystal or a single beetle carcass, just turning it over and looking at it. Uh, and then, uh, at some point, again, Huxley keeps coming back into this. I uh, decided that I would become uh, a writer, not because I loved writing particularly, but uh, because I admired uh, all the attention that great writers seemed to have heaped upon them, which was something that I, as a goggle-eyed weirdo, was not getting much of. And I, so then the name Huxley recurred again, and I started reading through all of those novels, the, the social novels, you know, Antique and Chrome Yellow, After Many a Summer Dies the Swan, and all the rest of it, uh, Ape and Essence. And finally, I came to a work of nonfiction by Huxley, The Doors of Perception and Heaven and Hell. This was by now uh, probably 1958. I was 14 years old. And in that book, Huxley, the quintessential English academic establishment intellectual, describes his uh, confrontations with mescaline and what it meant to him. And it was fascinating to me because previously all I had ever known or heard about drugs was what I had learned from reading Huxley's novel, Brave New World, which is a, a, a pharmacological dystopia, if there ever was one, and has lots to say to society today, I think. If you haven't read it, I recommend it to you. If you have read it, you recall that it was a society of people, perfect people, grown in vats, who died early, but who never lost the bloom of their youth, who were herd-minded, driven by advertising, and entirely dependent for their happiness and psychic equilibrium on a drug called Soma. And they had little advertising slogans which they would repeat by rote if anyone displayed inappropriate anger or emotion. A gram is better than a dam, they would display public uh, drug sound proposition. Here is this same author writing of mescaline and reaching for metaphors drawn from Meister Eckhart, St. John of the Cross, John Chrysostom, comparing the the light falling into the folds of his trousers to the light of Caravaggio and Duccio and Fra Angelico. And um, I was amazed. I had never heard such carrying on. Well, now, if you go back and look at the, the Doors of Perception, you realize that this was not an extravagant telling of the nature of the psychedelic dimension. It was, in fact, a fairly conservative rendering, a description of uh, low-dose, eyes-open, thoughty psychedelic voyaging. I mean, it's been a long, long time since I've set a stack of Abrams art books by my left knee before I take a psychedelic. But back then, that was how it was done. And you looked at the visible world. Well, so then, around this time, there began to be alarmist uh, articles in the press about the abuse of blue morning glory seeds by some of the more uh, crazed and unassimilated members of uh, American society, and I immediately tore out and purchased a couple of packets of Blue Morning Glory seeds, and uh, and uh, and then noticed that uh, 
the leaves imprinted in the fabric of the drapes in the living room all seem to have little faces who were <laughs> dancing. This was, in fact, clearly the intent of the designer, but something that in all the years of living around these ratty drapes, I had never <laughs> noticed. And then I began to look at everything around me and discovered that this affinity for looking into things that my rock-hunting, butterfly-collecting uh, habits had instilled in me had become like turbocharged. And swimming in the depths of polished stones, ponds, the ditch running down the back of the backyard were myriads of worlds. And I went outside and I was looking around at everything and then I, I just felt physically overcome. My knees basically gave way underneath me, and I sat down under a tree, and I closed my eyes, and my life has never been the same since, because there, waiting behind closed eyelids, were, uh, you know, ruined cities covered with creeping jeweled lichens and uh, inhabited by shining-eyed creatures that were, I was not sure exactly what, and much, much more. And I just spent a half hour or so literally in trance gazing into this unfolding reverie of Deserts, jungles, machines, archaeological artifactria, machines in orbit around alien worlds, all of this stuff. And uh, I was stunned. I still am stunned. And that essentially set the compass for my, uh, the rest of my intellectual life. I didn't understand, really, what had happened. In other words, I didn't clearly get it that this was a trip and that it was induced by the psychedelic. I understood something of that, but I thought also it must be unique. It must be my mood, my expectation. Or surely this cannot happen on demand through the simple act of eating morning glory seeds being sold at 35 cents a pack down at the hardware store. Um, and so then I began to ask questions, and I quickly discovered it was a mistake. So I went to Huxley and read more carefully, saw that he was working from the early of Pavlov Ellis, Weir Mitchell, um, it's Hugh Ludlow. Uh, it turned out that this whole tradition, albeit an underground tradition in Western intellectual or aesthetic terms, based around the perturbation of consciousness with substances. Uh, Coleridge comes to mind as an example. And... Uh, you may know his poem, Kublai Khan. Kublai Khan was written in a flash, basically, based on an opium reverie. Coleridge was uh, an aficionado laudanum, which was a, a tinctured form of opium that had a great vogue in the 19th century. Well, I knew nothing about opium or laudanum or the style of the 19th century English intelligentsia. But in the lines of Kublai Khan, I could feel this same siren song iridescence that had been in the pyrite crystal, in the butterfly wings, uh, in the beetle bodies. Uh, here, let's go out on a limb and really take a chance here. 
In Sanadu did Kublai Khan a state dome decree where Alf the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea. So twice five miles of fertile ground with walls and towers girdled round and there blossomed many an incense bearing tree. Five miles meandering with a mazy motion, the sacred river ran, and it goes on and on, and then it says, it was a miracle of rare device, a sunny pleasure dome with caves of ice. And that notion, not the sunny pleasure dome itself, but the notion of a sunny pleasure dome with caves of ice, introduced me to the concept of what's called in alchemy coincidentia positorum, where two things which are mutually exclusive are juxtaposed in a way which creates a shock in the mind, a poetic shock that is then potentially memorable. Years later, I used this effect to uh, title my book, so that's why you get the invisible landscape, true hallucination. See, this is uh, all hideously contrived. <laughs> well, eventually, and after many adventures too painful to recall, I ended up at Berkeley in the fall of 1965, which was what an incredibly, probably the most together thing I've ever achieved with my life in terms of things, because I was neither early nor late. I was not 10 miles off or a thousand miles off. I was dead on. I was right at the very center of the flowering of the cultural revolution that is now vilified and fondly recalled as the 1960s. And uh, I was living in a ratty rooting house in San Francisco that summer before going over to Berkeley. And there was a guy living across the hall from me who uh, replaced all the white light bulbs in his apartment with red light bulbs and painted his windows black and played the made chords of freight train on his slack guitar over and over again. And uh, he went on to glory as uh, Barry Melton, the lead guitarist of Country Joe and the Fish. And I didn't know it, but at the time they were in the studio laying down the tracks for uh, electric music for the mind and the body, which was one of the defining freak albums of that era. And he introduced me to uh, the joys of cannabis and further to something called Sandos LSD, which was uh, going around in these little tiny double O capsules. And uh, it was as if the previous Morning Glory vision had now been lifted to a whole other level of intensity. And everyone around me was undergoing these kinds of experiences. And there was a sense of incredibly accelerated change. You could palpably feel the acceleration of change seemed to be in the water, in the air. Uh, once I moved to Berkeley, I, I noticed that the large billboard that they changed for Telegraph Avenue every 30 days contained cryptic messages uh, that were inevitably addressed to me and my uh, affinity group. Uh, in short, serious boundary dissolution and category and scramblement was creeping into my uh, mental universe. And then, 
after about six months of this, I had a very strange friend who lived in Palo Alto. He, uh, he still is my great inspiration. I wish I could coax him into public display because he's the real Terence McKenna. <laughs> but if you're the real Terence McKenna, you have too much good taste to ever do what I do. So, uh, but he came to me. His, his style was to, to get there first, whatever it was, to do it, to reject it, and to be absolutely contemptuous of it by the time anybody else even <laughs> arrived at the scene of the crime. So in early 1967, he came to my house in Berkeley one rainy February night, and he said, uh, something you might be interested in. And I said, what's that? And he said, uh, this is a material that has been boosted from an army research project being run down at SRI, and someone managed to get a 50-gallon drum of this material out of the inventory without anybody knowing. And I said, what is it? And he said, it's called DMT. And I said, it's a psychedelic drug, right? And he said, right. And I said, how long does it last? And he said, three minutes. And I said, no problem, bring it on. <laughs> because after all, I had been assaulted by Life magazine on the subject of LSD, and I had gotten that under my belt. And I was by now uh, relatively sophisticated about cannabis. I figured there were probably no more frontiers to cross. And uh, so we sat down then and there and uh, did it. And about 15 seconds after choking up on this stuff, I found myself plunged into an elf nest somewhere on the other side of the universe. In other words, there were, um, and thank God no one fills in for me because they know it so well, uh, <laughs> jeweled self-dribbling basketballs. Did I get it right? <laughs> jeweled self-dribbling basketballs that came bounding toward me from all corners of this domed, underground space. Well, I had been used to hallucinations, acceleration of thought, funny ideas, strange insights, hysterical waves of giggling, so forth and so on. I had never seen anything like what I was now face to face with. And also, whatever this substance was, it didn't affect me. It didn't affect my perception of who I was. In other words, it seemed to me that the drug wasn't working. It was simply that the world had disappeared and been replaced by something else. And I was still who I had been a few moments before, except now I was fairly alarmed by what had just happened to the architecture and geography of uh, Southern Telegraph <laughs> Avenue. And these, uh, these things, there was an overwhelming sense of affection, involvement, a sense that I hadn't experienced since being six years old and being released on Christmas morning to run out to the Christmas tree. And there was a sense of childlike innocence under conditions of extraordinary alienness and unfoldment. And just, I was boggled, the mind boggled. I at last understood the real meaning of this uh, new cliché at that time. And these things were making objects with their voices. They were singing in this unearthly, 
crystalline, punning, elf chatter kind of language. But it was not something simply heard. It was something which I could see. I could see syntax unfolding like ribbons being spewed out of machines, shooting across my visual field, rolling into balls, condensing as objects with rotating crystal and facets and machined interiors of gold and ivory and chrysolite. And these objects were themselves emitting strange singing language-like noises and the whole thing was happening at an enormous speed almost like a Bugs Bunny cartoon run backwards at about three times ordinary speed well I barely had time to take all of this in and you know assure myself that I wasn't dying before it collapsed, the way a tent collapses, the way an ice cream cone melts, the way an erection disappears, the way an investment goes bad, it just was gone. And uh, my friend, I was sitting there, I opened my eyes, and my friend said, so what do you think? <laughs> and I was... Uh, <coughs> I was uh, stunned. I've never actually seen it hit anybody quite as hard as it hit me. I, for about 15 minutes, all I could say was, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I can't believe that. I can't believe that. It's, you, call that you call that a drug? <laughs> you, you must be nuts. It, Drugs don't do that. I mean, drugs speed you up, slow you down, make you fall down, stuff like that. This is no drug. It's magic. It masquerades as a drug. It's a doorway into another world. I kept having the image of Aladdin's lamp, my favorite fairy tale, and I felt like Aladdin. You know, you buy something in a junk shop, you take it home, you try to clean it up. The next thing you know, a flame a mile high pours out and demands to do your bidding. That was the impression I had. And it's the impression I still have. That must have been early 1966, 66, 76. 86, what is it, 36 years ago? That's not possible, 26 years ago. Nothing has particularly changed. Nothing has ever surpassed it. And it, for me, that was the moment that set my auto compass for life. I mean, I said, this I must understand.